Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session on food systems transformation for nature and people. Thank you for taking time to join us today. We have an extremely interesting program ahead of us with many great speakers and case studies. Before I go into the details about today's session, I'd like to remind everyone that we are in a planetary emergency. Human activities are destabilizing our climate and food systems and destroying nature faster than it can recover. In doing this, we are undermining the planet's ability to support us, increasing our, our vulnerabilities to pandemics and accelerating climate change. We are also compromising the planet's ability to supply us with healthy and nutritious food. The food we eat and the way it is produced is driving biodiversity loss through overfishing and converting natural spaces. Wildlife populations, for example, have shrunk by 68% on average since 1970. And our food systems had driven the vast majority of this loss. In the past 20 years, almost 100 million hectares of forest area were lost. We are converting huge areas of nature to make space for food production. This has been the cause of 80% of all deforestation around the world. When we lose biodiversity, we lose species and spaces which are essential allies in our efforts to combat the climate crisis. Intact natural spaces store carbon, provide oxygen, and regulate temperatures. Food systems produce around 29% of all greenhouse gas emissions, including from land use change, soil degradation, unsustainable livestock farming, and emissions from rotting food that goes uneaten. And climate change increases the risk of our lands and oceans becoming unproductive and decreases our food security. In the areas where we produce food today, more hot and dry days per year will reduce soil quality and shorten growing periods, leading to lower yields, which is likely to drive the opening of new areas, which will further compromise nature and the food system itself. Climate change isn't projected to reduce just the volume of food, but also the quality, since higher levels of CO2 in the atmosphere would potentially decrease density of nutrients in our crops. For the benefit of nature, climate and people, we must urgently transform our food systems, but not just to minimize their negative impacts. In fact, we need to unleash the potential of the food system to support a nature positive and net zero emissions world. There are ways to produce food in harmony with nature and provide enough healthy and nutritious food for all. Nature positive production practices like agroecology and regenerative agriculture and an embracing of agrobiodiversity will support diverse ecosystems around the world, restore soil health and increase carbon sequestration capabilities of agricultural lands. Instead of simply extracting from nature to produce food, it is possible to farm with nature, benefiting all ecosystem services and people. Dietary shifts to include a higher proportion of plant-based foods in our plates can further decrease the carbon footprint of the food we eat. And if we become less wasteful and improve distribution, access and affordability, we can reduce the amount of land needed to feed the planet, leaving more room for nature to thrive. To achieve nature, climate and food security goals together, we must focus on a strategy that has three integrated parts. First, we need to protect natural ecosystems from conversion and degradation. Second, we need to work very hard so that existing food production in land and water are sustainably managed. And third, we must restore degraded ecosystems and rehabilitate soil function and soil health. Today, we will explore five key solutions that will help deliver these strategies. We will discuss how agri-food support, including subsidies, could be redirected to support a nature-positive food system how we can transform food supply chains to eliminate deforestation and conversion from them. Then we will discuss how soil health can be restored in degraded areas. 
the role of innovation for people, nature, and climate. And finally, we'll wrap up uh, by exploring how all these solutions are capable of transforming landscapes that work for people and for nature together. We have just nine harvests left in the UN Decade of Action. That's just nine more chances to change how we produce food. But this year, with the Food Systems Summit and Climate COP, we have a unique opportunity to course correct. I hope you will enjoy this session. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Dr. Christian Mann, and I'm the Policy Action Lead for the Just Rural Transition Initiative. The Just Rural Transition was established at the UN Climate Action Summit in 2019. We're bringing together food producers, governments, and businesses to champion people-centered solutions to food systems challenges. This doesn't mean we think nature-based development is unimportant. On the contrary, we believe nature-based policies, investments, and programs can work best when they align with the real needs and interests of people who are closest to them. Now, a critical component of a just rural transition is repurposing public support to the food and agriculture sector. Every year, governments spend upwards of $720 billion in support of their agriculture sectors. Yet less than 10% of this support helps meet climate, biodiversity, and sustainable development goals. We wanna change that. And we wanna do so inclusively in a way that meaningfully amplifies the perspectives of food producers. This year, the UK government, the World Bank, and Just Rural Transition have been working with over two dozen countries to build support for a policy action agenda. This agenda identifies a range of concrete actions that both governments and non-state actors can take to repurpose public support to agriculture. To learn more about the solution, we'll first hear from Marco Sanchez Cantillo, the Deputy Director of the Agricultural Development Economics Division at FAO. Greetings, everyone. Making things happen in transforming food systems for nature and people is a tall order, especially when up to 811 million people face hunger in 2020, and 3 billion people in the world in more corners do not have access to healthy diets. We are challenging nature, and nature is challenging us. To make food systems fit for purpose for today's realities, we must first take a few steps back to before we even produce food. I'm talking about how governments support farmers. A brand new report just launched and published by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the UN Development Program, and the UN Environment Program give us the big picture on the state of global agricultural support to producers. And with this, a lot of food for thought for today's hot session and discussions. Currently, almost $540 billion are spent globally to support individual farmers. 87% of this incentivizes farmers to produce specific crops or use a specific inputs, mainly to fair market prices in return, but also to fiscal subsidies. These policies distort markets and can be harmful to the environment and human health. You may not be surprised to hear that the most emission intensive commodities such as beef, milk, and rice, or unhealthy ones like sugar, receive the most support. A business as usual approach to keeping this support as it stands now would mean that by 2030, governments spending on agricultural producers could approach $2 trillion. A significant share of this huge amount would be going against better nutrition, better production, a better environment, and a better life for all. Therefore, we cannot carry on with support as usual. On the other hand, support that is more collectively given to farmers through the provision of general services or public goods, including infrastructure and research and development, represents only a small share of total support even if this is the least distorting form of support and provides the highest medium to long-term returns. The multi-billion dollar opportunity report shows that distorting market measures are still prevalent in high and middle income countries. While in low income countries, such as those in Sub-Saharan Africa, rates of support are negative, or in other words, farmers are penalized with low prices, understandably to help the least well-off consumers. Therefore, 
This is a global problem, but best solved nationally. The report does not advocate for stopping support to farmers, but rather for reconfiguring this support to promote climate smart farming practices, enhance production efficiency, to feed a growing population more nutritiously, and to be kinder to the environment as we do, leaving no one behind. This will not be a walk in the park. There is no one size fits all repurposing strategy as every country needs to tailor its own repurposing strategy. I want to encourage all of you to check out the report. I invite you to take note of the six step guide being proposed for countries to design agricultural support repurposing strategies. I hope that by the time you see this video, bold action will already have started in this area thanks to the momentum of the Food System Summit. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Sheng Fan, former Director General of IFPRI and co-lead of the work to repurpose public support to agriculture under Action Track 3 of the UN Food System Summit. Dr. Fan will speak about the steps that have already been taken to scale back harmful subsidies and the need for agricultural subsidies to be repurposed to shape public funding for public goods. At this moment, we are spending almost $700 billion a year in subsidizing agricultural production by using more fertilizers, more water, and more land to produce staple food crops. These subsidies are not sustainable. They do not produce adequate enough nutritious and healthy foods. They are also not economically efficient. So these sub subsidies need to be transformed, needs to be repurposed. Here sitting in China, we are part of the challenges, but we are also part of the solutions. So China is spending more than $200 billion in subsidizing its agriculture production. So in that report, based on data, based on analysis, based on modeling, we propose seven strategic transitions. And number one is to repurpose agriculture subsidies here in China, to promote healthy and nutritious food production, and to save water, land, and to help mitigate the climate change. So the subsidies will be kept in agriculture and the food sector, but they will be repurposed for achieving new goals. So number two strategic transition is to promote multiple wind technologies. Winds in nutrition, winds in climate mitigation, climate resilience, and winds in smallholders income. Of course, national food security. So multiple wind technologies will have to be supported by government support, particularly by repurposing subsidies. And number three is to invest in new infrastructure. The old infrastructure, such as irrigation, rural roads are still important. But today, e-commerce, internet platforms are the new infrastructure. And we must invest more to make sure that smallholders' production can be linked to affluent urban markets or even global markets. Number four, is to promote institutional changes. So agriculture used to be part of agriculture, Ministry of Agriculture mandate. Health and nutrition are part of Ministry of Health mandate. And the environment, finance are in different ministries. Now, can we bring all these ministries together to set up a mechanisms, national leadership group or national coordination mechanisms to bring all the different elements together to promote the food system transformation. And the number five is to respect nature. We learned a huge lesson from COVID-19 or from previous zoonotic diseases. So nature and human beings have become very close because of the intensification of our food production. So in the future, we must respect nature, keep some safe distance between human and the nature, and to regulate the wet markets, you know, vegetable, fruits, meat markets. So keep, keep them safe, high standard of hygiene, 
and make sure that the animal diseases will not jump to humans. And finally, is our behavior. So what we eat really matters to our health. Equally important, it also matters to our environment, to our planet. So the consumers need to be aware and eat healthily, nutritiously, and also sustainably. So if we want to change the world, let's change ourselves first. Our next speaker, Victoria Prentice, is the Honorable Minister for Farming, Fisheries and Food to the United Kingdom, speaking on the UK pathways of transforming food systems and the role of repurposing agricultural support. As the Minister for Farming, Fisheries and Food in the UK, I love talking about agriculture and I was really pleased that the COP26 campaign includes a focus on sustainable agriculture. Over the last decades, we've seen a big increase in food production. There are costs to this success. We can all see the effects in, in climate change and in environmental damage. Substantial amounts is invested in agriculture by governments globally. In England, we're shifting from a land-based subsidy to providing public money for public goods. This is challenging, but should provide real benefits, both in terms of biodiversity and carbon capture. Finally, we'll hear from Ariana Giulio Dori, Secretary General of the World Farmers Organization to speak to the importance of recognizing farmers as the anchors to our food systems, especially when it comes to developing better agricultural policy. I'm here to represent the War Farmers Organization. We are a member-based association representing 1.5 billion farmers from across the globe. Our mission is to bring the independent, authentic voice of those who produce food in the international arena, wherever there's a conversation that affects the livelihood, the future, the business of the farmers. It is therefore natural, almost obvious to us, to be confronted to the discussion on how to repurpose agricultural subsidies. And we're doing this in the only way that is possible for us, that is by putting farmers at the very heart of it. How to do it? First, by recognizing the farmers for their real identity. Farmers are people. Farmers belong to families and communities. But farmers are also economic actors that on top of it are delivering invaluable ecosystem services. They are agripreneurs that bear the burden of the business risk on their own shoulders. Second, it's necessary to listen to the needs of the farmer, to consult them about their challenges and expectations and hopes for the future. And it's important to feed the political reflections with the data gathered from these consultations. Third, listening is good, but it's not enough. It's important to welcome the solutions developed by the farmers, solutions that are pragmatic, oriented to action, and connected to business models, products, uh, new techniques or practices. Last but not least, being farmer driven does not mean that farmers own their solutions on their own. All of the opposite. It's fundamental to embrace a holistic approach where farmers co design, co build solutions with other actors in the system and policy makers. Because for sure, solutions must make sense to the farmers and in particular to the most vulnerable among them, that solutions must deliver on the expectations of the society and must cope with our planetary boundaries. Thank you very much. Despite heightened awareness of the importance of forests as nature-based solutions and a raft of commitments from public and private sector, 
Natural ecosystems like forests, grasslands and savannas are vanishing rapidly. And the evidence is clear as to where the responsibility lies. The vast majority of deforestation and natural habitat conversion is linked to agricultural expansion and commodity production. The continued expansion of commodities such as beef, palm oil, soy, coffee, cocoa and timber contribute to nearly 40% of global tree cover loss. Without safeguarding such critical ecosystems, we cannot ensure human and planetary health. Deforestation and conversion-free supply chains are a critical first step towards and condition toward achieving global climate, biodiversity and development targets. Unfortunately, while there's increased recognition of the issue and a clear social duty and very compelling reputational and operational imperatives for business, there is still a huge gap between commitments and implementation and aspirations. Our first video provides a summary of the key findings from a recent WWF and Boston Consulting Group report on deforestation and conversion-free supply chain. Deforestation and conversion of natural ecosystems are continuing at alarming rates around the world. And despite many businesses having stepped up about 10 years ago and making commitments around eliminating deforestation and conversion from their supply chains, that hasn't happened. There's still a huge gap between aspirations and commitments. businesses to step up and to raise their ambitions, to implement those ambitions, and to advocate for integrated approaches where supply chain work that they're doing is nested within appropriate policy and legislative and trade frameworks. It's clear that governments, the private sector and financial institutions have a very important role to play in demonstrating greater leadership to reverse the trends in conversion and deforestation at the hand of our food system. The next video is about the accountability framework and will explain the path forward, how to move from commitments to action and implementation via a common set of norms and guidance for establishing, implementing and monitoring ethical supply chain commitments in, in agriculture and forestry. After that, we'll then hear from Anna Turrell, Head of Environment at Tesco, and she will speak about the private sector and how that is rising to the challenge and the successes and learnings from Tesco's road towards deforestation-free supply chains. For global supply chains to prosper into the future, communities and ecosystems must also thrive. Companies worldwide have committed to finding this balance in their agricultural and forestry supply chains. But how do we move from commitments to results? Without a good map of the territory, the path forward isn't clear. This can lead to uncertainty, inaction and risk. And without common measures of progress, it's difficult to know how far anyone has advanced. As a result, deforestation conversion of ecosystems and human rights violations persist. Hearing the calls for a clear and common roadmap, the Accountability Framework Initiative, AFI, was born. Arising from collective experience and collaboration, the AFI guides companies on the journey to set commitments, take action, demonstrate progress, and contribute to broader positive impacts beyond supply chains. The AFI defines a clear framework for action, offering common principles and guidance, 
to help companies mitigate risk, manage supply chains to meet commitments, drive continuous improvement across commodities and regions, and communicate progress to customers and stakeholders. We're heading into a new era of responsibility, where successful business means that people and nature also thrive. Let's take the journey together. The Accountability Framework, delivering on ethical supply chain commitments. Private sector action is critical to achieving deforestation and conversion-free food supply chains. No one would disagree with this. But how we as companies take action and work together across the landscapes we source from remains a very lively conversation. As a company with long-standing commitments to eliminating deforestation and conversion within our forest risk commodity supply chains, we've learned much along the journey so far. But we certainly don't have all the answers. Tackling deforestation and conversion is wickedly complex. And as companies, we rely on the support of government and civil society to help create the environments we need to drive scalable, lasting transformation beyond our own supply chains. This includes rolling out robust due diligence legislation to help raise the bar across all of industry. Individual company action centered around ambitious, clear public commitments is undoubtedly critical. It's how we're able to report on the progress we make and enables others to hold us accountable for that progress. As companies, we must continue to transparently account for the efforts we make, even when sometimes we don't get as far as we might like. Our commitments and targets must correspond with tangible supplier requirements, including DCF cutoff dates aligned with the AFI and mechanisms that enable increasing transparency and accountability back up the supply chain. At Tesco, we've learned from our suppliers that we need to support them to come on the journey with us. That means providing guidance, tools and our time to support them in building capacity to engage and deliver on our shared ambitions. And this takes time. We've learned that in order to be effective, we've had to phase the scaling of our commitments and ambitions over time. We can't do everything at once and neither can our suppliers and their suppliers. Our soy transition plan has been running for over five years now and will continue to run through to our 2025 target of sourcing only soy from verified de deforestation free areas. But beyond individual company efforts, the biggest opportunities the private sector has today to tackle this issue is through collective action, because systemic issues require system wide approaches to tackle them. It's why Tesco led the development of the SOS for the Sahado Manifesto and supported the creation of the Soy Transparency Coalition. It's why we continue to act, be actively involved today. I'm especially excited by the work we're doing currently as part of the CGF Forest Positive Coalition, leading the development of landscape level approaches to protecting and conserving forests, ecosystems and livelihoods. So in summary, there's a lot to go after and it's easy to get overwhelmed by it. But as companies, it's incumbent on us to take action and do it now. There is no time to waste. We must lead with bold commitments, but take a phased approach to action, which brings others in our supply chains on the journey with us. Everyone has a role to play and everyone must be held to account. But we aren't alone. And by working together, by sharing knowledge and experience and taking collective action, we can get there. It's become more and more evident that integrated approaches where corporate commitments work within policy frameworks and trade standards alongside increased financial incentives and governance are needed to ensure a just transition to sustainable agricultural and forestry production. The next video is from GIZ and will speak to this need and examine the roles and responsibilities that different stakeholders involved to build deforestation and conversion free supply chains. Deforestation free supply chains. Forests are essential for the survival of not only plants and animals, but also us humans. They are the basis of life for more than 1.6 billion people. Forests provide us with food, produce oxygen and regulate the climate. As a result, we have to protect them. But the reality looks very different. Every four seconds, an area of forest the size of a soccer field vanishes from the earth to satisfy increasing consumption. We're continuously cutting down trees. We use the areas to cultivate agricultural raw materials like soya, palm oil, 
rubber, cocoa or coffee. Many governments and companies have already realized that we cannot continue like this. They have committed themselves to setting up supply chains free of deforestation. Therefore, international agreements regarding this have already been reached, not least because consumers are becoming more aware of sustainable products. For this reason, companies that are now focusing on sustainability have a clear advantage. If you obtain your products in a retraceable and verifiably sustainable way, you don't have to worry about possible import barriers in the future. You can fulfill the increasing demand for sustainable products and improve your reputation through environment-friendly purchasing practices. Resource-conserving cultivation ensures these companies can fulfill their requirements for raw material in the long term. However, those who do not change to sustainable deforestation-free production risk crop failures due to depleted soils and water shortages. With deforestation-free supply chains, we can prevent this. The participating parties first identify a suitable region in which the raw materials grow and where the forest is worth protecting. Then the parties agree on a collective approach towards forest conservation. Our aims are to improve the living conditions of farmers and their families by ensuring they receive a decent income. For example, by optimizing and diversifying cultivation methods for which we specifically train the farmers on site and by setting up long-term supply relations. These will be transparent thanks to a traceability system. A monitoring system checks the progress of forest conservation. We're building deforestation-free supply chains together for a sustainable future. More information can be found at giz.de. Our last speaker is Justin Adams, Executive Director of the Tropical Forest Alliance, and I was able to speak to him to get his take on what he thought the most important actions were to close the implementation gap and to share some examples of the best practice out there. Hi, Justin. Well, uh, thanks for joining us on this uh, very important topic. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to dive right in with the first question. So what would you say are the most important things that need to happen to make this a decade where we really close the implementation gap and make good on our commitments on deforestation and conversion-free supply chains? Hi, Damien. Good to be here. I, yeah, I think you absolutely put your finger on it. The, the, we have to move from a decade where there's been a lot of talk, uh, a lot of commitments into a decade of action. I think at the heart of that is transparency. I think we're going to continue to see the revolution of transparency. And I think companies uh, really need to step up and, and recognize that, that uh, we've got to bring full transparency to all supply chains uh, so that we actually understand where the products are coming from. Uh, but also transparency of impacts. I think, you know, given the, the, the scale of the climate crisis and the recognition of the land use contribution to climate, I think there's going to be more and more push on scope three emissions. So I think transparency will be will, will continue to be central. Um, I think the second thing I would say is that this integrated agenda has got to start focusing more on the livelihoods of the many uh, millions of smallholders that produce uh, the commodities that we're talking about, uh, often uh, with uh, uh, often very, very poor uh, communities that uh, we need to also see how we can support their transition and that we're not seeing degradation of forests uh, because those communities have no other options. So I think bringing a social dimension to this and not just an environment dimension to this will be critical. Uh, and then I think the third thing, and again, we've heard this, is, is nobody can do it alone. So public-private partnerships, really how government can work, how business can work, and how civil society can support these transitions is going to be crucial. And we've got some good examples of that, but we, that needs to become the norm, not the exception. So, so building on your on that, then in terms, of, so in terms of these best best examples, what what gives you greatest cause for hope? Where where are the best examples out there we can we can build upon? I think what gives me what gives me cause of hope is is actually where we are seeing genuine collaboration, genuine listening. I think the fact dialogues that the UK is uh, uh, is running as part of the COP26 presidency 
creates a dialogue space between the global north and global south. You know, it's still to see what, what will come out of that, but I think it, it creates new opportunities. I think where you see some of the leading companies, the Consumer Goods Forum, not all 350 organizations, but 20 of the key organizations that, that, uh, that really source a lot of these commodities, uh, they come together in this forest positive coalition. And I think we're starting to see uh, with what they're publishing now in terms of how they're measuring progress, uh, I think that starts to really set the bar of, of where and how the market actors can play. And then I think you just need to look at some of the progress that we've seen in some of the uh, the countries and commodities. I think the Cocoa Forest Initiative in, in Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, and looking at this, this interface between poverty, smallholders uh, and forests, I think. So there are a few examples. Uh, we need to see a lot more, uh, And uh, uh, but but there are there are reasons for some hope, but clearly there's a lot of work ahead. Fantastic, Justin. That's that's wonderful. It's been um, a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for your time and insights. I wish we had longer, um, but I think we're going to have to leave it here for now. Thank you, Damien. So I hope you enjoyed the session, a timely reminder of the urgency of the situation. We're still losing around 10 million hectares of forests alone annually, uh, at a time when science is clearly telling us we need to be restoring ecosystems. The speakers and the videos clearly demonstrate that we know what needs to be done and that there are many solutions already out there along with tools and guidance and platforms for effective collaboration. I'm really grateful to Anna from ESCO who demonstrated the importance of private sector leadership um, within and beyond supply chains and to Justin from Tropical Forest Alliance who eloquently highlighted the importance of integrated approaches private and public sector partnerships, but also the critical importance of uh, engaging civil society and particularly smallholders uh, in the upstream elements of supply chains. So I think we can conclude by saying that there's no more excuses for, for inaction. Um, we need to turn this from a decade of missed targets and false promises um, to one of increased ambition, but critically uh, of action and implementation. Thank you. Hi everyone and welcome to our session. I am Lee Winowicki, a soil scientist and lead of soil and land health at World Agroforestry C4E Craft. I am so pleased to be here to set the scene for this important session on the restoration of degraded soils for food production. As we know, land degradation affects 25% of the Earth's surface and negatively impacts 3.2 billion people globally. This severe degradation limits the soil's capacity to deliver key ecosystem services and functions, including nutrient cycling, blood regulation, crop production, and carbon sequestration, to name a few. This session will emphasize restoration actions from the policy level to implementation and scaling on the ground. We have two distinguished speakers to highlight these various aspects and two videos showcasing activities on the ground. Given the urgency to restore degraded soils, let's start right away. This first video, highlights the role of healthy soil for functioning ecosystems. Filmed right here in Kenya, where I'm calling in from, we can see how land stewardship for soil health can improve food and nutrition security, contribute to climate change mitigation, and improve livelihoods. Let's watch it now.
address the environmental impacts our food systems have on land while increasing food system resilience and improving livelihoods and food security, the way we produce food must change in order to restore the current disbalance between nature and food. To speak more on this subject and the urgency of restoring degraded land as a direct impact from unsustainable practices, I am pleased to welcome our next speaker, Tina Bernpilli, the Deputy Executive Secretary from the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. Dear friends and colleagues, how do we feed a growing population in a way that replenishes our natural capital? We do it by balancing our food systems relationship with nature. Our current food systems are the product of the myth of infinite growth. We produce, we consume, we waste. Expanding grazing and croplands are in a large part responsible for the destruction of the natural world. Our food systems contribute to the growing climate crisis. If we do not rebalance these systems, we will walk into deeper trouble. Restoring balance means recovering the health and productivity of forests, of drylands and of grasslands. It means making the most of existing farms by scaling up nature-positive agricultural practices. It means accelerating the transition to a circular economy. The scale of land restoration commitments globally, 1 billion hectares, gives us a big hope. But these commitments need to be translated into action. Regenerative practices such as agroforestry, organic agriculture, and sustainable rangeland management will be front and center at the Food System Summit this year. By supporting small-scale farmers on these practices, we can reduce poverty and hunger, we can create jobs, reduce the need for new land, enhance resilience to climate change. With the right incentives, these solutions can also be implemented on industrial farms bringing higher yields and nutritional value at lower cost. Indigenous peoples and local communities often lead the way in environmental stewardship. They must be involved and empowered, including through strength and tenure and security. We must be flexible and adapt solutions to local conditions. A global shift in consumption is just as important. Demand for cheap processed foods and meat-rich diets drives agricultural expansion and harmful industrial practices. Meanwhile, any food lost or wasted is water and land squandered, coupled with avoidable emissions. This is why we have to change. Why it is so important to leverage the new investments, business and partnership models of the Food System Summit in the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. If we do this, we will bring agriculture back into balance with nature, and we will build a healthier, more peaceful, and more sustainable future. Thank you. Out of balance ecosystems, climate change, biodiversity loss, and unsustainable use of our natural resources affect all of us, including farmers and fishers who produce our food. We will now hear from these communities and the challenges they face, the importance of protecting, managing, and restoring nature to support food security and some of the sustainable practices they have already adopted. Let's watch this video of Voices from the Field. Well, if we continue consuming as we are, we're actually going to exhaust our resources. We betalen allemaal overal ergens een prijs voor en met de kennis van nu moet het anders. Porque isso aqui se nós vamos pescar de qualquer maneira, amanhã os nossos filhos, os nossos netos não há de ter sucesso. Não há de conhecer nada, só há de ver o mar, pelo menos a água, dizer, mas aqui o que vivia. Chaka jata, dina kulula matumbateni, hafifte geji. Kuma chaka shino, 
Fukwa jone ya kuti mvula kuyambila 1 January, kufika pa 25 January, sina abwele. Imene hita andipangi sekuti ndikulole matumba wili, amene ndita aje kwa menzi wili. Samula kwa 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 El cambio que hemos tenido es un cambio muy desfavorable. Por lo menos en época de verano, ya las conchas por falta de lluvia se comienzan a morir. Y realmente eh, la situación del cambio climático está afectando mucho y estamos preocupados por, la, por el deterioro de la tierra. Necesitamos urgentemente eh, buscar los medios de renovar la tierra. Yo creo que es un poco de trabajar con la naturaleza. Doordat alles een functie heeft, is het een groot risico als soorten uitsterven. Ik denk dat er een tijd was meer pech. Maar nu zijn er meer pechadores. Dus als er een soort pech is, die het 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 pech is. Het is moeilijk. Want we zijn altijd pech. Dus we moeten het pech beschermen. พี่ว่าต้องให้ความสําคัญกับการเกษตรหรือว่าการผลิตอาหารที่กลับมาฟื้นฟูฐานทรัพยากรธรรมชาติ I grew up on a farm in Iowa and I understand how important it is that we understand how to use and manage the ecosystems in sustainable ways so that people can get the food and income they need to survive This is the same every place in the world จากจากชุดที่จุนอาร์เกตเตอร์ก็มุกเลสทีมกัตตาร์ดเวอร์เบย์ว่าก็มีนั่งสวาร์จุนอาร์เกตเตอร์ก็มุกเลส O meu trabalho é de organizar o sensibilizar o pescador, não utilizar artes nocivas, saber conhecer o espécie proibido quando pelo menos pescam aquela espécie, poder devolver. Bueno, en estos momentos, os produtores de cacau estamos tratando de trabalhar o que é a agricultura orgânica e, além disso, estamos metendo de muita, muitos maderáveis à finca. para tratar de conservar no solo suelos, sino el aire y fijar suficiente carbono. Que ik zie mezelf als rentmeester. Het idee is dat ik de aarde beter achterlaat als dat ik hem ontvangen heb als het ware. Dat is dat mijn doelstelling. Abena, ik kan naar manera. En kan ik niet waar ik aan te komen. Maar zie je niet leren. Ook al het futuro. Ik geloof dat niet alleen de agrarische sector, maar ik geloof dat de hele samenleving een ontzettende uitdaging heeft om ons voedselsysteem te veranderen. Maar het kan wel. I am so pleased to introduce our next speaker and my friend Patricia Combo, founder of Pottery. She is a UNCCD land hero, as well as the recent winner of the Youth of the Year Award for Kenya. Top 35 under 35 in the environment category. She will be sharing with us examples of scaling up solar restoration solutions on the ground and really highlight the importance of community participation in this process. My name is Patricia Combo from Kenya, the founder of Patricia Initiative and a UNCCD Land Era. And today I'm here to talk about community engagement and the role community plays in promoting restoration and also ensuring we promote sustainable land use practices. What we are doing at Patricia is we are working with schools in ensuring we promote climate literacy, environmental education, and also working with communities in changing their mindset towards land use and also towards land-based jobs. In Patri, what our key model is working with communities because we realize no matter the innovations, no matter what, the community plays a key role in ensuring restoration is adhered to and also in ensuring they promote some of indigenous knowledge on sustainability, restoration, and also ensure because they are the custodians of nature and they interact with nature on their daily basis. With Patri, what we are trying to do, we are, our main question is what, where, and why. And that's why we are raising a generation that first appreciates nature, understands nature, a generation that is confident, and a generation that is equipped with the 21st centuries to, trans, to transit in the green jobs and green circular economy. And secondly, we are what, what are we doing? 
we are ensuring that we promote a solution that is cost effective that is that does not inquire a lot of cost to the communities and that's why we are working on recycling readily available materials by harvesting indigenous trees and by growing fruit trees because we want to add value to the community and show them the benefits of restoration because they can have food medicine and nature at the same time without having to interfere with their daily activities and secondly we are putting communities at the center of implementation by listening to them and having them talk to us and to why to, just to understand why they are doing certain things and these give them confidence because they are able now to share why they have been practicing some of the things and by talking and the dialogue we are now able to change their mindset and show them the benefit and also trying to transit them into sustainable land use practices. We notice that a community that is not well exposed, a community that does not understand and, and appreciate nature will not always understand the benefits and that's why we are working day in day out in changing their mindset and also raising a generation that ad, uh, that understands there is a lot of opportunities that can be tapped into that can be tapped in the land sector by showing them that they can get jobs in the green economy, that they can transit and also earn an income from just conservation and also using land and other natural resources sustainably. We believe that a child and a community without environmental education is like a bird without feathers. So in all what we do, community comes first and mind ch mindset change should always be our key role in ensuring we change their mindset towards land and show the positive impact that land, nature has into their livelihoods. Thank you very much. I would like to extend a sincere thank you to everyone who has joined into this session. And I would like to conclude by highlighting four key messages from the session. First, I hope this is everyone's takeaway message that through stewardship, we can improve soil health. Second, that scaling investments are in soil health are urgently needed to meet not only the SDGs, contribute to the goals of the three UN conventions, the UN Food Systems Summit, climate actions and ecosystem targets, but really to achieve and improve food and nutrition security. The third is that this multi-stakeholder action the public and private sector engagement is needed to bring equitable financial incentives to the farmer to overcome economic barriers in order to scale soil restoration actions on the ground. And fourth, we can translate science into action to inform policy and decisions. With that, I would like to thank the presenters and the video producers and the organizers of this exciting event. I will now sign off and hand it over to the next moderator. Thanks so much for joining. Good day, everyone, and welcome to this session on transforming agricultural innovation for people, nature, and climate. My name is Danish Dinesh, and I will be the moderator for this session. I work for the CGI research program on climate change, agriculture, and food security. The reason we are having this session is because a lot of resources are spent on agriculture innovation. There was a recent study from the Commission on Sustainable Agricultural Intensification, which found that between 50 to $70 billion are spent every year on agriculture innovation just in the global south. Can you imagine that? That is a lot of money. But of this, only 7% goes towards climate change and environment related objectives. That's unacceptable. We're facing a climate crisis at the moment. We are seeing biodiversity loss with agriculture as a, as a primary cause for it, for it. And in this circumstances, we're still not spending enough money devoted to agriculture innovation to tackle these challenges. So in today's session, we're going to discuss how can we shift the dial. Firstly, we'll see two examples of innovation on the ground in the Philippines and India from WWF on efforts to reduce food loss and waste. 
So we will see how these innovations can actually work on the ground. After that, we'll have another intervention which shows a vision for taking forward these innovations and many others to 100 million farmers by the end of this decade. So I'll now hand over to the next speaker. Hello, my name is Aditya Kakodkar and I work for the Marine Program of WWF India. Today, I'm going to present to you a project which we, uh, which we have undertaken. It's called Have Your Fish and Eat It. It's about creating a mobile technology-based artisanal fisher to consumer trade chain. The main aim of this uh, project is to improve the livelihood of the fishers by optimizing catch value and promoting sustainable fisheries. Uh, so there were several issues at hand when we started. So one of them was that artisanal fisheries is a very disorganized sector in the Indian context. Again, there is uh, no proper price management and there's a lot of illiteracy amongst the fishers. So this gives rise to a lot of loss to them financially. Then there are middlemen uh, which impact the fishing uh, fishers income because they buy at very low prices, they pay the fishers very low and they sell very high. Uh, so a direct marketplace was required where the fishers could sell directly to the consumers and the adoption of smartphones is quite high in the Indian context. So uh, an app would have been ideal. So we went with this solution. So we have developed two uh, smartphone apps, both, both are in beta testing. There's the fish hub which is the consumer facing app and there's the fish marketplace, which is the uh, fisher facing app. So this is a small demo of the fisher facing app. So you can see there's a listing here uh, with uh, fishes having different color codes. Uh, then uh, there's, uh, they can choose the size, the weight, they can set a price of the fishes. It's a very basic app, which can be easily used by the fishers. Uh, then they can also set the time and a basic, uh, location of uh, the place where the fish was caught. Then there is also, uh, uh, they can set the place where they would meet the consumer and where the consumer can go and pick this fish up. And once they submit this, they see a preview and that once that is submitted, there's a listing created. So once this listing is created, the, there's a notification which goes to the consumer facing app from where the consumer can order the fish. So there are uh, several benefits of this solution. Uh, like uh, there's environmental sustainability men mentioned, um, maintained because uh, of this color coding, which we, uh, uh, which we have adopted. This helps the consumer in choosing the fish which are abandoned and not going after the fish populations which are decreasing. There's also less uh, loss and wastage of the fish. Uh, the fishers can uh, get together and set a standard price for the fish. Uh, thus avoiding the middlemen. There's some level of uh, fish origin traceability because they enter the location from where the fish was caught. And because the fish was locally caught and sold, uh, there's a higher percentage of the fish which is consumed. And also the consumers get to uh, eat uh, freshly, uh, freshly caught uh, sustainable uh, fish. Uh, there's also, uh, this eventually leads to the uh, increase in the income of the artisanal fishers. Uh, thank you very much. WWF Philippines, the Sustainable Diner Project, has been engaging with the hospitality sector, eager to find green solutions on food waste. WWF focuses on empowering these companies to reduce their food waste at source, explore the possibility of donating surplus food, and diverting unavoidable food waste away from landfills. Composting is the natural process of decomposing organic matter with the use of microorganisms under controlled conditions, and it creates compost, a rich source of organic matter that improves soil health. However, composting proves to be especially challenging to pull off in urban areas, as it requires a good amount of time and space. All too often, businesses and even households cannot afford. Other concerns raised included odor, hygiene and sanitation, pest control, and irregular waste collection schedules. The Sustainable Diner is able to address these concerns by teaming up with Greenspace, a company solely focused on food waste composting. Together, we developed a mobile app called Soilmate, 
which aims to grant residents and businesses easy access to Bokashi composting and a centralized food waste collection system. Soilmate offers a smart management solution that allows users to greenly manage their food waste through different composting subscription plans, hassle-free book a bucket exchange, easy account monitoring, and food waste generation and GHG avoidance tracking. Moreover, app users can opt to donate their earned compost and vegetable bags to the partner communities of urban green communes and garden beneficiaries from Good Food Community. The mobile app is now available to download in App Store and Google Play Store in the Philippines. Thank you for those really fascinating experiences from India and the Philippines on reducing food loss and waste. Now we are going to hear from Lisa Sweet, who heads the Future of Protein work within the Food Systems Initiative of the World Economic Forum, on a new effort to develop a multi-stakeholder platform to take innovations like the ones we've seen and many others to 100 million farmers by the end of this decade. Over to you, Lisa. Thanks so much, Danush. It's really a pleasure to be here today and to be taking part in the Nature for Life Hub. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to speak to everyone today. As the audience will have already heard, there's a lot of effort taking place around nature positive production, from the transition to deforestation and conversion free supply chains and the need to restore degraded soils. And later in these meetings, you'll hear a bit more about the changes that are necessary in taking place at the landscape level. And across all of these different pieces, what we're really seeing is the recognition of the role of agriculture and food systems on delivering for climate and nature in the future, and how these changes can take place through critical hotspots of focus. Where I want to reflect is on the commentary from Ariana from the World Farmers Organization at the beginning of the Hub's meetings. And speaking to this, the importance of recognizing the farmers as the anchors and the stewards of our food systems, recognizing their centrality in being able to deliver on the changes we want for our food systems of the future. It's this recognition of the farmer centricity that has led to the development of the 100 million farmers platform, which is seeking to drive the transition towards net zero nature positive food systems by putting the farmer at the center of the ecosystems of design and development for the support that is needed. Our platform seeks to take collaborative action. It is looking to break silos across food, nature, and climate agendas and stakeholders. And it's looking to build and scale pre-competitive multi-stakeholder action at the regional or country level that responds to the specific needs of the farmers in a particular region and a particular geography. Through a platform mo modality, the 100 million farmers is seeking to bring together disparate efforts and to catalyze a scalable transition that will bring together the incentives and the ecosystems of support to transition 100 million farmers towards climate smart, nature positive practices. Why 100 million? This number is the symbolic of reaching a mass scale that will create the tipping points of change needed to enable these developments to make their way into market formalization and drive towards the end goal. That large scalable change starting with the farmers is so central and so needed. So once again, a true pleasure to be here talking with you today around the 100 million farmers platform. We look forward to working with everybody as we move towards integrating the relevant efforts and driving the necessary and critical changes that's needed for our world today. Thanks so much and back to you, Janush. Thank you, Lisa, for that really inspiring pitch about reaching 100 million farmers with net zero nature positive innovations by the end of this decade. It's really important. If we have to shift the dial on climate change and nature loss, we need this level of ambition. So what do we do next? And I would like to bring your attention towards COP26, the UN Climate Change Conference, which will take place this year in Glasgow in just about a month. And this is an incredible opportunity for us to get that shift in agriculture innovation, together with many other sectors to win the fight against climate change. 
So what can we do? Fortunately, there is a campaign on transforming agricultural innovation for people, nature and climate, which the UK is leading through its Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and CCAFS is a co-chair and secretariat of. So we have an incredible opportunity there. What is this campaign trying to do? We're trying to do four things. Firstly, we're trying to increase the level of investment that goes into agriculture innovation that delivers for people, nature, and climate. Secondly, of the investment that currently goes into agriculture innovation, we're trying to shift the focus. As, we, as I mentioned before, only 7% is focused on climate and environment ob objectives. We want to shift that to at least 30% so that the focus of agriculture innovation efforts can be aligned to the challenges of climate change and nature loss. Thirdly, we've seen incredible innovations today. How can we take them to scale? So we are looking at better models to get innovations to scale, that scales that matter to, to deliver benefits on a global scale on climate change. Finally, we're trying to foster inclusive dialogue with people from all over the food system on different perspectives, on different innovations. So can we come together and reach consensus around some of the critical issues for transforming agriculture innovation? So I welcome you to join the campaign and to join efforts at COP26 so we can get this done. My name is Melissa Ho, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Freshwater and Food at WWF US. Welcome to session five on food systems transformation at the landscape level. People's connection to food is undeniable. Food is central to our health and well being, our culture and identity, our preferences and values, and our relationships. And yet, the way our current food systems have evolved, we are often disconnected from how the food we consume and share is produced leading to a relationship with nature where food production is more extractive than regenerative. The communities around the world are demonstrating how we can protect, manage, and restore nature through food systems transformation. By leveraging our human connection to food and supporting local communities to locally manage and conserve their own natural resources and the landscapes that support sustainable food production and their livelihoods. In this session, we will hear examples from Bolivia, the Northern Great Plains in the United States, Malaysia, and Kyrgyzstan, where they provide examples of success when people are reconnected to their food systems and are committed to sustainably protect and manage the landscapes that we all ultimately depend on. Our first speaker is Samuel Sangueza from WWF Bolivia, who will demonstrate through work in the Pantanal Chaco how food, water, and nature are all interconnected Hi, greetings from Bolivia. We're delighted to be part of Nature for Life Hub this year and of this specific session on transforming food systems at the landscape level. One of the things that has me worried is that by 2050, the planet should be reaching 10 billion people, which is roughly 20% more of what we have now. If we were to live in a planet that would expand in proportion, this would not be a problem at all. But the reality is that our future is connected within planetary boundaries. And as we know, us humans are pushing the planet to its limits, which will bring very difficult choices on climate, nature, and food. I was staggered by a recent report from WWF titled Bringing It Down to Earth, which shows that agriculture occupies half of our planet's habitable land. In most agricultural land, which is over 8%, is used uh, to produce animal food directly through grazing or indirectly through the cultivation of feeds. Let me talk to you now briefly on the importance of sustainable management of landscapes as a key approach to address the triple challenge of food biodiversity and climate. This from the Cerrado Pantanal Chaco region and specifically from our work in Bolivia. This approach takes shape from a protected but conserved landscape vision in the department of Santa Cruz, which borders Paraguay and Brazil. Here we work on a landscape over 9 million hectares of conservation units from national protected areas to indigenous territories. The approach is truly landscape in terms of ecosystem conservation, connectivity, and best practices 
of production. One of the initiatives we're supporting relates to cattle production within the San Matias Integrated Management Area of over 2 million hectares. This area is affected by fire caused uh, still by slash and burn agriculture that because climate extremes and droughts often goes beyond control and affects large areas of grasslands with impacts on climate, biodiversity and water. This is the case of grass-fed livestock from a regenerative agriculture approach connected to local markets of beef that we aim will generate price recognition of the efforts of sustainable and deforestation-free cattle production. This is just one short example in which by engaging local communities, private producers, and markets from a sustainable landscape approach, we can produce positive outcomes of the triple challenge of food, climate, and biodiversity. We truly believe that this approach is key for a planet in which people and nature thrive. Thank you. Our next speaker is Wiesepan Little Elk, the CEO of the Rosebud Economic Development Corporation, or REDCO, and visionary leader of a project to dedicate nearly 28,000 acres of tribal grasslands in South Dakota to bison restoration. Here, the aim is to develop what will become North America's largest native-owned and managed bison herd. Wiesepan Little Elk invited WWF to support his dream of bringing their relatives, the bison, back to Sichangu, Lakota territory to heal the people, the land, and their cultural connection to bison after an absence of nearly 140 years. There are opportunities to heal our land. Uh, buffalo are a keystone species. When you introduce buffalo back into the prairie ecosystem, the original prairie ecosystem starts to rebuild itself and you see increases, increased biodiversity. Uh, we're going to see increased carbon capture. Um, and there are also going to be economic opportunities as well in terms of jobs that are created. This is an opportunity to not dwell on the past, but to acknowledge it and move forward with new vision and with new light into a future that is healthy for our people, for our region, and for the planet. And this is going to be an example, not only for other native nations, but really for the rest of the world to look at and say, hey, these guys are doing something pretty cool out in the, the middle of what we now call South Dakota. We can do that in our area, in our territory as well. The resurgence and the emergence of Buffalo along with the resurgence and the emergence of native peoples and the hope and the opportunity and the idea that we can have better days ahead of us go hand in hand. We now continue with another exciting example from WWF Malaysia. Their Living Landscapes program combines conservation restoration, and sustainable development to produce sustainable palm oil in Sabah, Malaysia, following a landscape approach. Sabah's rainforest is documented as some of the most diverse in the world. However, economic development has greatly affected the protection of Sabah's biodiversity. There is a need to find a middle ground between biodiversity conservation and economic development through an integrated landscape planning, creating a living landscape. The living landscape concept is so simple. It teaches us how to share, and most importantly, how to have control on development. Achieving and maintaining a delicate balance between economic development and protecting our forest and its inhabitants. It is about conservation at landscape level, where we affect change via protecting and managing our forests, supporting sustainable certification of oil palm, as well as restoring forests by developing wildlife corridors. These three areas, which we refer to as pillars, all happen within one landscape. 
Over the next five years, the Sabah Landscapes program will work on three landscapes, Tawau, Tabin, and Lower Subud. This comprises over 1 million hectares. The program will adopt three pillars, protect, produce, and restore. Through Protect, the program aims to support the government's commitments to forests to ensure that existing forests are not destroyed and degraded. Through Produce, the program aims to achieve this commitment through group certification within a landscape, particularly working with smallholders and middle growers. Still, many plantations cut through forests used by wildlife such as the born and elephant. This increases incidences of human-wildlife conflict. Restoring habitats and creating ecological corridors can help reduce this conflict. In the next five years, the Sabah Landscapes program will aim to effect change via its three pillars, protect, produce and restore, for the benefit of nature and people. It is up to us. Following this great example in Malaysia, I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Mr. Norbeck Karievich Alambekov, Chairman of the Committee of Agrarian Policy, Water Resources, Ecology, and Regional Development with the Government of Kyrgyzstan, who will provide us with an example from Kyrgyzstan, where they are developing an organic district. Organic Продуктуларды өндіруді негізінен биокейджи, органикалық қиымылы пайда олып, шол қиымылын арасын алдында көптеген бізден дейханлар башқошу, берегішіп, бүгін күгінді алардын саны ишқаналарды айтсақ, бұл аймақтарды айтсақ бір 12-ден ашығырақ, негізге мұнда экспортқа шығар ватқан органикалық бұл фермерді ишқаналар, біз шоңдары бұл жетеу олып саналар. Оқыған дейхандар бізде менден ашты. Бүгінгі күнді үштеткен территориясы үш жарым мен гектарға чамалап қалды. Органикалық аймақ Қырғыз Республикасында бұл негізіне найыл-айыл жерлерінде кішінекей аймақтарда жайғашып жатады. Келечекте үшіл біздің ойуыз, мақсатуыз үшіл Қырғызстанның көпчілік территориясын үшіл органикалық аймаққа айландырып үшіл жерден органикалық, экологиялық таза продуктыны өндіргенгі әрекеттен жатауыз. Бұл бағытта бізден аграрлық саясат, су ресурстары, экология және регионалдық өніп түрі бойынша комитеті өкіметменен біргелікті 2018 жылы органикалық айлчарба өндіруші мұйзамын, органикалық айлчарба мұйзамын қавалалып бердік. Шының негізінде әзір бір ғатшы тепкіштері менен алды ғатшы тепкілетауыз. Жақынқы айларда ұлыттық органикалық стандарттағы Әлчарба Министерлігінде ұшыл органика департаментінде тарауынан іштеліп шықты. Бұл бізге еміне өрет, бұл бізге өз өзінің стандарттарды іштеліп шыққанға. Егер біз бұл сертификат ұл стандартты, ұлыттық стандартыңден айқалыштырып жүверсек, бұлардың басы да қымбат болып, Дейханлар ұзғадағы, әлі өзгедағы, экологиялы ұзғадағы, ландшафты ұзғадағы өте бір жақшы жетішкендіктер болып түп үшені тұрауыз. Бұйырса, органикалық қайын шаруасы Қырғызстанда өні көт. Бұл органикалық қиымылдың өзінші асоциация бар, әзір федерация түзіліп, биокейджи органикалық қиымыл федерациясы жақшы Әлчарбасы департамент түзіліп, жақшы іштерді алып барып жатшат. Бұйырса, біздің мамелекетті шол органикаға, экологияға өте көңіл бұрылар болуатат. Біз ұлыттық өнігі стратегия ұзғадағы 2018-2040 қадағы шол органикалық, экологиялық продуктыларды өндіру өнші стратегиядағы қамсыз болып кеттік. To accelerate the transformation of our food systems, there's an urgency for improved multi-stakeholder collaboration. Our last speaker is Lee Smelvin, Senior Advisor on Multi-Stakeholder Collaboration at the UNDP Green Commodities Program. So my name is Lisa Melvin and I work with UNDP Green Commodities Program on 
multi-stakeholder collaboration for systems change. And as we've heard uh, through this uh, program, a lot of what we work with is very complex systems. Food systems are complex by nature. And I think we, in a world where all the technical solutions are known, we know what to do, we know the technical solutions. And we also think that we're collaborating and we often have great intentions around multi-stakeholder engagement and collaboration. But what we've learned um, and what we see is that really collaboration has a deeper how to it and we're not giving that enough attention. And so one of the things that we think is essential for transforming landscapes and transforming uh, food systems at different levels is being able to focus on the how. And this is really uh, about putting people at the center of systems change. As Akim Steiner says, our administrator at UNDP, people change systems, not systems. And so this looks like moving from, you know, those kind of meetings that you've been in where, you know, the same people with power stand up and give their PowerPoints and people are on their phones and not interacting to a really well-designed, curated and uh, expertly facilitated sessions where people are actually co-creating and creating new innovative ideas. Um, we've, we are actually this week at UNDP launching a guide to effective collaborative action. And we've really identified four key practices that we think are essential for all people involved. One is to build and um, come from a place of systems leadership capacity where we all get to have different roles in leadership. Also to work with power that we have to acknowledge that there's power in the system and that we don't want to ignore that that has an influence on how things can change. To work through conflict so that we don't avoid it, we don't um, push it out of the room or get stuck or buy it, basically. And then um, also effective communication. And very much it is just also about listening as much as it is about talking. So we think that these key practices are essential to weave throughout a process. And also, when we collaborate, uh, we get to um, be in a group where we get to understand the complexity of the system, the food systems and the landscape systems that we're trying to change. And as we come to understand it, we embrace, the, let's say, different perspectives or worldviews of how that system works. And then that allows us to see new opportunities and potential ways of shifting that system to a sustainable operating future. And we really hold that that piece, that understanding the system in a collective, is, needs to happen first before we can know what will emerge in terms of a potential solution or in terms of how people work together to create future sustainable food systems and food landscapes. What great examples from around the world of visions and actions for food system transformation to sustain landscapes where people and nature thrive. To scale these aspirations for food systems transformation globally, a key theme across them all is that community ownership and management of their own natural resources is critical in order for solutions to be relevant, resilient, and robust over the long term. Each story is unique to the context, the commodity, and the geography, but engaging the people on the ground is universal. It is tempting to seek a silver bullet solution to drive scaled change, but first we must start by supporting and lifting up the voices and visions of the producers, indigenous peoples, and local communities on the ground and learn and share from these experiences. I am deeply inspired by these stories that we've heard today and feel renewed hope the change that's already beginning to happen on the ground. These examples should inspire us all to do so much more to create change at the landscape level through food systems. Thank you. Policy often dictates outcomes, whether it's through incentives or disincentives. It is therefore incredibly important that world leaders set ambitious and bold targets and create national pathways for food systems transformation. This has to feed down into regional and city level governance. However, there are many other actors throughout the food system who 
who are just as important. None more so than our farmers, fishers, and other food producers. They are the true stewards of land and water resources, and in that role, they are the guardians of nature and climate. There needs to be a whole of society approach to developing and implementing solutions, bringing together various levels of governance and other diverse groups to address power imbalances and manage conflicts of interest. I'm pleased to welcome my good colleagues, AJ Jakar, Emmanuel Faber, and Shakuntala Tilsted uh, into this panel discussion. Shakuntala, uh, how could blue and aquatic food contribute to end malnutrition, build healthy, nature positive, and resilient food systems? And also, how can blue and aquatic foods be integrated into government's food system strategies? Thank you, Joe, and thank you for having me at this event. Aquatic foods, they, which have diverse animals, plants, and microorganisms caught and harvested in waters, offer unmatched potential to transform food systems and to achieve multiple wins towards the sustainable development agenda. In many low and middle income countries, aquatic, aquatic foods, fish and other aquatic foods, are integral to diets food production and culture. Aquatic foods are superfoods in the fight against malnutrition. Diverse fish, bivalves and seaweeds produce multiple micronutrients and essential fatties, fatty acids. And these nutrients are essential for cognition, for growth and development, and to combat multiple forms of malnutrition and diet related diseases. Aquatic food systems produce highly nutritious foods at comparatively low carbon emissions and environmental impacts compared to many land-based crops and livestock systems. And aquatic food systems, both marine and inland fisheries, and also aquaculture and the associated supply chains employ many of the world's most vulnerable, many of whom are women, youth, and indigenous communities. So if we sustainably and inclusively increase the consumption of aquatic foods, these are nutritious foods, and then also the access and supply, and at the same time having the low environmental footprint, of our global food systems, reducing waste and loss of food, we can provide equitable livelihoods for the world's most vulnerable. And as I said, especially women are included in this group. Evidence is showing us that we can increase the supply of diverse aquatic foods in many countries, in Africa, in Asia, and Latin America, while keeping within planetary boundaries. Evidence also is also showing us that policies and investments in aquatic foods can put us on the pathway to sustainably increasing nutritious foods for our growing population. Although demand for aquatic foods is rising around the world, we know that many poor uh, women and children are not eating sufficient amounts to get the full nutritional benefits of aquatic foods. Work more on consumption patterns, on having aquatic foods and aquatic food products that are nutritious, safe, acceptable and affordable for all. If we look at the policies, traditionally food and nutrition policies overlook aquatic foods. And aquatic foods, as I've just explained, is in the true essence for the global call to transformation of food systems for healthy people and sustainable diet. And if you would look at the platforms we have today, the Food Systems Platform 2021, COP2026, and the UN Biodiversity Conference, we have very strong platforms for making use of aquatic foods to nourish all people, all nations, and our planet. 
if we would move to the integration of aquatic foods transformation into policies, we need governments to link nutrition and health policies with aquatic food system policies and vice versa. New studies show that some governments are increasingly prioritizing aquatic foods to nourish nations, but more must be done. If we look at several national food-based dietary guidelines across the globe, we can see that fish is not well represented in many countries and within aquatic foods, if at all there is a recommendation on aquatic foods, then it's only on fish. All other aquatic foods are not mentioned. If we ensure that aquatic foods take a central role in food systems research, policies and investments, we can then capture their full potential to achieve multiple wins across the sustainable development agenda. For example, let me give you one an example from the state of Odisha in India. In, Odisha has prioritized the link between aquatic foods and nutrition and health. And this has revolu revolutionized the fight against malnutrition through the inclusion of fish in child and mother feeding programs. It is initiatives like this which can take off and which can make the connections in policy and lead towards aquatic foods nourishing peoples and our planet. Emmanuel, the private sector has been deeply involved in the UN Food System Summit preparation with a number of great commitments. How to translate these into actions? The biggest area of recent additional commitments is certainly regenerative agriculture. It really gives me hope because CEOs who made these voluntary commitments did so because they came to the realization that this is an imperative for the resilience of their business. In order to protect productivity through climate change, restore soil health and enhance farmers' incomes. But to be honest, not everything will flow naturally. Within that space, I'm confident, for instance, that carbon sinking practices will become mainstream and then gradually soil health regenerative practices, but we still need a much bigger push on agricultural biodiversity. We are relying on way too few crops, varieties, species, and this is a systemic risk in particular in view of climate change. So we need a much broader repertoire, more local number of seeds, varieties, species, critical missing link between nature and our diet. And it requires a complete overhaul of our food system approach. So that's what we're working on at One Planet Business for Biodiversity, but it's only experiment and we're bumping into the fact that the, there is a need for change in regulation and laws to truly tap into what nature has for us. So, at scale delivery by business on these commitments and inroads will no doubt mean much more collective action where farmers, farms, soils, living organisms are really at the center. We see certainly more and more parties taking on this path, but clearly we also need to acknowledge the fact that this is a revolution for many and it may take some time. AJ, we have heard repeatedly about the importance of placing farmers in the center of this food system transformation. How can we ensure that as well as being nature positive, our food systems are also equitable and inclusive? What can we do to ensure farmers, fishers and food producers everywhere are at the heart of this transition? To grasp the magnitude of the crisis, since 1970, the population size of mammals, birds, amphibians, and reptiles has declined by two-thirds. One in every nine people on the planet is sleeping hungry, even while 40% of the food is wasted or lost. We need to address issues, such issues that plague regenerated, inclusive, and equitable food systems. We can look at issues like reframing of w WTO rules, which drive millions of farmers and people, rural people, into poverty and hunger and forced migration, consolidation in food value chains, biased and unconscious bias in public research, now forced to look for private funds from private individuals, fertilizer cartels, governance issues of philanthropists and businesses shaping government policy, making farmers more dependent on markets for nutrition. The silver lining here is that these levers and outcomes were created by public policy and thus can be reversed. 
there is a representational asymmetry where society has reached a conclusion that those who produce from the land, the less articulate, aren't good stewards of knowledge and don't require a place at the table. To transform the food systems to be more equitable and inclusive, we need to ensure that when policy is made, the beneficiaries, the farmers, the producers, the fishers, the pastoralists, they are a part of that process. Our key message today is not about us without us. Shakuntala, thank you. Now, I'd like to ask you a question that I will ask all panelists. Uh, could you name one or two concrete actions required for a food systems transformation to be implemented in the next few years? In particular, which policy changes are required and what kind of support is needed? We must ensure aquatic foods are no longer overlooked in food systems and public health policies around the world. By prioritizing the link between aquatic foods and nutrition and health in research, in policies and investment decisions, we can move to a holistic transformation of food, land and water systems to ensure sustainable, healthy diets for all. For this to happen, policymakers must have the knowledge and scientific-based evidence to be used in policy formulation. For example, having the knowledge of the multiple benefits of aquatic foods, policymakers can then ensure that national and subnational food-based dietary guidelines include diverse aquatic foods. Then with this in hand, public procurement policies can be put in place for social safety nets, for example, school feeding and mother and child health programs. And these programs and policies are now of crucial importance for the growing number of hungry and malnourished people due to the disruptions we are seeing of COVID-19. Given the scale and the speed at which we need to change, I think we need support from governments, multilaterals, in three directions. The first is ensure that we come to carbon pricing mechanisms as soon as possible that will allow to fund soil health restoration across the planet and shift agricultural subsidies from pesticides and entrants into biodiversity positive subsidies in order to enhance the incentives for farmers to do so. The second is really to change in the ag and the food regulations what is currently not allowing to open to local untapped repertoire of seeds and species that would allow farmers to quickly adapt their models to the local climate, soil and uh, water uh, changing conditions. And the last one is linking and reconnecting much stronger the food and the agricultural path. We, we need to think about food sovereignty in a manner that incorporates planetary diets that are both healthier and more sustainable. These are going to be essential path forwards on which there is a critical work to be done with multilateral and governments to reach the goals that we have of sustainable food systems. For a transformative change to succeed where food is grown within planetary boundaries and helps mitigate climate change, farmers have to receive the true value for the produce that provides for dignified livelihoods. This is not happening today. Because we lack external barriers like societal accountability, the power relationships within the food systems is not self-correcting. Convincing those that make policy, those that influence policy is difficult. But what is even more difficult is convincing policymakers to act on the commitments they make in public space. Therefore, it's paramount to create awareness amongst the people, not only to pressurize policymakers, but also to provide political space for policymakers committed to change. The importance of collectivization as an approach can help exercise agency 
even in these unequal systems. Time is ripe for a sort of social movement centered on collaboration between producers, consumers, and even stakeholder capitalism, where businesses are not just accountable to their shareholders, but to the society and community at large. Even the Paris Climate Change Summit came about because citizens pressurized politicians in their respective countries to, to act, and that is the power of activism. But more importantly, a mere dismantling of power is not enough because it invariably leads to a more sinister force replacing the existing power structures as we are seeing happening now. Time is ripe for dialogues where different people with different opinions can come together and decide on a better future. Time is ripe for humans to reshape their relationships with other species on the planet. I'd like to thank all our speakers for the rich discussions. We have seen many great examples of the work that is being done to transform food systems for the benefit of nature, climate, and people. And I hope you leave this session as inspired as me. What needs to happen now is for this work to be scaled and accelerated. It is essential that the food agenda is integrated into the climate agenda and the nature agenda. As I outlined at the start of our session, these are not separate problems and they cannot be solved with separate solutions. We must move away from siloed and piecemeal actions and into integrated strategies. This will take a lot of energy and commitment from all of us. We need to bring stakeholders from across the food system on this journey. But we must also ensure that conservation and climate actors understand the importance of food systems transformation and are implementing tangible actions. The time is now for ambition, boldness, and urgency. Let's seize the moment. Thank you. <laughs>